You're listening to the Option Alpha Podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again from Option Alpha, working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered online because it's based on one thing and one thing only, and that's helping you guys make smarter trades. So again, thanks so much for tuning in today. On today's show, I am very excited to bring to you an interview that I did with former CBOE options market maker, David Lincoln. And I think we had a, an amazing time on this podcast interview together. David and I have been communicating back and forth for a couple months now, kind of sharing stories and ideas and uh, chatting. And I invited him on the show because I thought that his experience and his background would give you guys a unique insight and look into how a market maker actually forms their duties, how he kind of thought about the markets from a different perspective. And I think some of the stories that you'll hear about how he went from, in some cases, making $100,000 a day to losing $300,000 in a single session and everything in between, I think is really, really insightful. And I'm very gracious and very appreciative that David was able to jump on and spend some time with us and kind of open up as we did this interview. So again, as I go through this interview, please pay particular attention to some of the topics and thought processes that we go through, specifically how we look at David's history as far as trading, kind of the differences between how market makers performed their duties previously in the past and now how technology and electronic exchanges are now changing that. We also talk about all of the different trades that he's made in the past and kind of different little mini case studies with options trades, with scalping trades in stock, with earnings trades and a bunch of straddles at one point. So a lot of different topics there. And then we finally kind of end the conversation talking a lot about his specialty, which is VIX and volatility trading. And I think you'll really enjoy some of the insights that David has about uh, how he kind of sees volatility trading and particularly trading products like VXX and UVXY. So without further ado, we're going to get right into the interview with David Lincoln. All right. Hey, David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? Well, thanks so much, Kirk, for having me. I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be here. I've been a, a fan of yours for uh, many years now, so it's very exciting to be on the uh, show. Very well. So, well, let's just start off and kind of give everyone a, a little bit of background on who you are and kind of your journey, I guess, originally to the markets, You know how you got started and that whole story, and then we'll work up to what you're doing today and keep going from there. Great. Well, I was a SIBO market maker for many years, and we were sort of the black sheep of the industry for a while because of our notoriety for taking risk. And people seem to think that the SIBO was a bunch of gunslingers way back in the day. And maybe that was true. But I got started in trading. When I was young, I would see pictures of people on the floor and the end of the trading day on the New York Stock Exchange and exhausted guys with paper all over the place. And I, I thought, wow, that's where I really want to be. And I got hooked in in college and after college as a intern for Shearson Smith Barney, where I was assisting a stockbroker. Basically, I'd have to help him find people to code call every day. So what we do is we would get annual reports and we would pull the names of all the directors off the annual reports, look up their numbers. And this guy I worked for was a really smooth talker. I mean, he if he came in the room with you, he would know your second cousin and he'd be able to talk about it. I mean, he he was amazing on the phone. But I realized working with him that I didn't want to be the one that was like raising money. I wanted to be the one who was figuring out what to do with money once we had it. And so eventually I ended up there. I kind of worked as a, an intern at the stockbrokers for a while. And then I went on to do other things for a little while. But coincidentally, a fraternity brother of mine got me a job opportunity or interview on the floor of the SIBO in Chicago. So I, I flew out to Chicago. I actually didn't even have enough money to for the plane ticket, but they, uh, they paid the plane ticket. I flew out to Chicago and I didn't get that job. But I was brought down to the floor of the SIBO and a broker who was standing in the OEX pit there said, I'll get you a job. Go to such and such a building and see this guy, Dave Cregan, and tell him that you've known Hunt Hammer for 21 years. So I went up to the office, this guy's office, and I said, my name is David. I've known Hunt Hammer for 21 years. The guy said, how old are you? I said, I'm 20 years old. 
And he said, all right, I'll give you a job. It's 300, it's 300 a week. Yeah. The spread doesn't make sense on that. You're known him for 21 years. You were 20. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. But the floor, you know, it, back then it was old boys network and it, it was the way things kind of started out was to you get a runner job. And I was fortunate enough to have somebody in my corner that told me like, don't squander this opportunity. They got me the two big trading books, Options as a Strategic Investment, which is a Macmillan book and Shelley Natenberg's book. And he said, start learning your synthetics and start studying. And so I went around to the different pits at the SIBO at the time during work. What I had to do as a runner was I would bring order tickets from the broker out to the pit. I was working for a company called Chicago Corps. And I would go and hand these pieces of paper to the broker in the pit. And then I'd have to hand back the fills once the orders were executed. So I went around. I went to all these different traders and I said, look, I'll work for free for you after the close. Finally, one guy said, I might know somebody who can hire you. And he brought me upstairs. It turned out it was him. And uh, he let me keep track of his trading cards of how many... Because as a market maker, you basically have these big positions. You'll have a stock and you'll have a position in almost every strike, every option strike. So it'll be... So at the end of the day, you have to kind of reconcile your positions. Every morning, you get an out trade sheet, which tells you if you're not matched right on trades with a broker. And you have to reconcile that. So I would help him with his sheets. He happened to be on the same floor for Merrill Lynch as a trading firm. And they ended up hiring me. That's awesome. So let me take a step real ba- like back real quick because I want to go through some points, which I think is interesting. So when you say the term market maker, what does that mean to you? Like As a guy who was a market maker, what do you think about it like your core job was? Because I think people hear market maker and they think it's you know guys that are just literally the grim reaper of regular retail traders, right? Like (laughs) the person who's out there to get everybody like, oh, it's the market makers, right? But back, you know, 10, 15 years ago or 20 years ago now, I guess, you know, that was totally different because there's very little, if any, electronic trading at that point. I mean, you guys were literally running slips back and forth. So what was it at that time to you to be a market maker? Well, as you said, back at that time, we had the open outcry system exclusively, which meant that you had to open your mouth to make a trade. And so a broker would come in and do a, make a quote. He would say something like, step 20 calls. And you would say, one eight three eights. And the first person to make a market that was the best market, if he was a buyer, if I was offered at three eights and the other people were offered at a half, if I was the first person with the best offer, then I was in control of the trade. And I could decide how many of the order I wanted to do. And so it was definitely a, uh, it was like an auction system. It was sort of like when you see those auctioneers on TV, something like that. But the way it was explained to me is that as a market maker, we're required to make a market in size for every strike. So somebody comes in with a quote, I need to make a two-sided market. What will I pay for something and what will I sell it for? And how many will I do at that particular price? But as far as like being the Grim Reaper and all that, the way we saw it on the floor was that the big guys upstairs are the ones who are in control of everything. Like we don't really know what's going on. We're just kind of trying to uh, respond to the order flow, trying to manage our risk as best we can. We felt like it was the big firms upstairs that were actually in control of everything. The the Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley's, those guys. And we never felt like we really were insiders. Right. And so I guess it was because order flow was coming down from them and you guys had to basically deal with order flow. And try to stay balanced, I guess, as much as possible. Would that be a safe assumption? Yes. I mean, it varied from stock to stock. Um, In the very small illiquid issues, if you were a market maker in the pit, you were pretty much required to do whatever trades came in. You couldn't just step away. If a trade came in, you had to do it. And so the only defense you had was to either raise or lower price quickly for the next trade. So is that why you see like even, even now, like today's market, you see somebody put in an order and then the, you know, pricing gets changed immediately. And you're like, what the heck, right? And you place another order and the pricing gets changed immediately again. And is that mostly a factor of it being an illiquid market and you know the market makers having to, they're basically forced to take on risk. So how do they compensate for that and they change price? Exactly. And you know, there was some games that were certainly played back then where people would, you know, sort of fade orders. Like you would make a two-sided market, but you wanted them to do one side or the other. You know, maybe you would make a two-sided market, but the bid, you really didn't want to buy any there, but you would love to sell some on the offer, uh, trying to figure out what they were, they were going to come in and do. And for example, 
some month, you know, sometimes at the end of the month in a stock every month, they would come and they would sell the D's call and buy the January one. And the next month they would come and sell the Jan and buy the, the Feb. And so you, if you kept track, I would keep a notebook and keep track of what was going on. You could kind of get ahead of stuff a little bit. But these days, it's not really like that because there's multiple exchanges. There's multiple stuff trading. It's electronic. You can't really keep track so well of order flow. But way back when, you could keep track of order flow. And in certain stocks, you were the monopoly in the world for that stock trading options. Yeah, that's fascinating. Because I think about like the world is much flatter now, right? Like you can't, you know, with not only the, just the increase in options volume and, you know, growth and reach, but also technology making it, you know, super fast and mostly run by computers. It's much flatter now to whereas you guys maybe had an idea of what order flow might come in. That might be insanely hard to do now on a predictive basis. Yeah, I mean, in some ways back then, it was fair in, in a sense that a broker could come in, quote something, and you would give him a, a market. And if, if he came back and paid your market, then you would honor that. These days, if it's all electronic, somebody can just turn off their computer and walk away if they don't want to play. But you know, back then, you, you, we did have relationships with the firms. And we did you know, feel an obligation to, to uh, honor our markets. So in some ways it was better, in some ways it was worse, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's probably, you know, a give and a take for everything. I'd still love to see more people screaming at the computer to make trades, but maybe they do. We <laughs> just don't see it. So, okay. So you got got through all that. You started, you know, got a, a new position. So take us from there, from where we left off. Yeah. So I was trained by uh, one of the top firms and they sent me to San Francisco because that was their base of operations to the Picoast, which was a smaller floor. At that time, there was the Amex, the SIBO, the Picoast and the Philec floor sort of. And I was trained in several different ways. Mostly I was trained like sort of to look at things in several different trading ways. I was exposed to different traders who had different uh, ways of thinking about things. And I was put on a seat and I was in charge of managing about 50 options positions at the same time to start with. And I was in a group of six people. We had to compete at mock trading in front of a blackboard to get our ticket into the trader trade e program. So there's like 20 of us. And after the close every day, we go upstairs to the blackboard and the real traders would make market, would uh, update the stock and options prices and we would make markets and we'd have to sort of prove ourselves to the other people and get a spot in this program. So I ended up going out to San Francisco and it was pretty intimidating. I was with a, a Yaley, a Stanford guy, a bunch of high powered people. And usually they'd send five people out and four would come back. Usually they cut one person. So it was a stressful situation to be, to be sure. And we, but we were very motivated. We lived and breathed options, everything to do with options. Our firm was, was not focused on really directional trading. It was more delta neutral trading. But we were very focused on like historical volatility levels on charts. And also our firm was very focused on the gamemanship of being in the pit and how can you manipulate the situation to be in your favor and there's a lot of game and chip that goes on on the floors, as as you can imagine. They were focused on that as well as just option strategy. But it was, it was a high level of option strategy. I would say it was like about college course in math of just basic math. And I spent a lot of time just doing fractions tables. I'd sit there on weekends and try to... Because back then it was eighths, quarters, and sixteenths. And you'd have to do math quickly in your head. And so it was like fifth grade math. Whoever is the fastest at fifth grade math is successful in life. <laughs> That's super fascinating. I mean, because it, yeah, it kind of forced you to be very, very quick on your feet. And so when you mean, what do you mean when you mean gamesmanship in the pit? So describe that a little bit just for a minute. Okay. Well, there was, when you first started in the pit, you had to sort of, it was called breaking in. And so people would try to intimidate you to go somewhere else. At the SIBO, there were 52 different uh, equity pits. And so if you could force somebody to go away somewhere else, then the pie would be divided among less people. Because in a sense, the way it would work there was there was sort of a established pecking order in the pit. And so if a hundred lock came in, one person would get 40, then the rest of the people would get 10, something like that. And to break into a pit was hard and people were jerks to you. There were fights, there was intimidation, all this kind of stuff. And so there was a right way to go about things in a wrong way. And fortunately for me, I was in a big firm that had a lot of money and that helps. 
But um, yeah, the floor was a it was a place of characters, and you had to kind of be a character to make it there. You you would do well there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, not much of a fighter, but I guess maybe character. But yeah, that's very interesting. So okay, so you started. Um, so you were working with this firm. You guys were doing a lot of option stuff, and you're out in San Francisco. Yeah, so I was on the fence because everybody else uh, had made some money. I really hadn't made much money, and. I was trading a stock called System Software, SSAX, and it was lunchtime. I was in the pit, and all of a sudden, this thing came across the Reuters tape that their biggest customer was suing them for their product being faulty. And I jumped on the phone. I got, I went to one firm. I said, sell 5,000 shares at the market. I went on to another firm, sell 5,000 shares at the market. I went to another firm, sell 5,000 shares at the market. And all of a sudden, the stock dropped $8 and halted. And... The phone rings back. You're filled. You sold 4,400 shares. The other guy, you're filled. I ended up making a bunch of money on that one day, over $100,000. I went upstairs. Everybody's patting me, slapping me five, blah, blah, blah. And I had my ticket back to Chicago as a trader. So that was very uh, stressful but exciting. And I started out in the Cisco pit in Chicago. And I had a fairly basic strategy. My strategy was to sell options before earnings. So first earnings came, I sold some straddles, I think. And it worked out. Second earnings came, I sold some straddles. It worked out. You can see where this is going. <laughs> Third, the fourth one, I sold some, I was short a lot. I was short a lot of gamma. And uh, earnings was fine. Everything was fine. And then this secretary, Snow, came out and said something about the economy and the Dow tanked, everything tanked, Cisco tanked. And being an inexperienced trader, I had to kind of defend my short gamma position. So I started selling shares all the way down and then the stock whipsawed me all the way back up and I ended up sort of negative scalping a whole bunch of money. And I gave up over $300,000 in, in one session, which was my year. Yeah. So it's, you know, people say, well, market makers know everything and are wired and are, are but if you look at my P&Ls, we had a lot of swings and it was a lot of um, individual incidents or individual um, situations. Mini black swans, little black swan ducklings. <laughs> yeah, I got it. <laughs> exactly. I had another situation where I, I was basically short some straddle. The stock was $30. I was short a straddle for $14. And this company, their one product was a FDA approval. And the FDA was either going to approve it or not. And stock's 30. And, you know, what do you do? Well, I didn't sleep that much that night. The next day, news came out. The decision's delayed. The straddle goes from $14 to a half dollar. And it was a huge winner. But, you know, things could have gone the other way. I had things go the other way. There's all kinds of stories from the floor, of, of course. So what do you think like in those, you know, instances, right? Because I mean, you say like a regular person going from, you know, like even just further into the extreme, one day you make a hundred grand on a position, great, awesome, top of the world. You know, another day you lose 300 grand in a session or, you know, during that whole position, you know, kind of unfolding. What are the key takeaways for the regular, you know, average retail trader that they can take away from that? Say like, here's how you improved or what things did you do different now or how would you look at it differently now you know now that you have the benefit of hindsight yeah well i mean in the in the case of being short gamma and negative scalping myself what i learned from that one was if things start to go against me when i'm let's say short a whole bunch of straddles in something if it starts to go against me i'm going to instead of defending myself by buying or selling stock i'm going to slowly trade options to get out of it, decrease my position. So instead of me selling stock on the way down, what I should have been doing is maybe buying some of those puts in that I was short. That way, I'm not going to get whipsawed on the other side. So each situation taught me how to be more mechanical in my trade. And so at this point, I have a very mechanical approach. Like If you watch me trade for a while, you could predict how I would act on any situation because... Uh, I've already sort of kind of thought through what I would do in these different situations and I act in a very specific way that is not affected by my emotions of the day or or what's going on besides that. Which I agree with. I mean, like I try to do that too, and I think, you know, like one thing I try to tell people when they sign up and, you know, start following the trades that I do is like after a couple months, you'll pretty much understand what I'm gonna do and 
you know, people will often email me and say, I got into this just before you. And I'm like, well, good. Cause like it, it was pretty cut and dry, like what you should have done. You know, like there's mm-hmm. not too much that needs to be left up to interpretation when you have most of it, you know, mechanical or systemized as much as possible. Yeah. And you can do th- a lot of times there's a right thing to do in a situation. And a lot of times you'll do the right thing, but the outcome still won't be what you would have hoped for. But you still did the right thing at that time, given the information you have. That's the toughest. Yeah, that's the bias, you know, the recency bias that always creeps in is like, I did this and it should have worked, but it didn't, right? And it was still the right decision ultimately. So yeah, I agree with that. So, all right, so let's transition a little bit to now, you know, like, I guess what your specialty is really is VIX and volatility and kind of trading around those products. So why don't you kind of walk us through let's say volatility in general, and then how we can trade it. And then more specifically, we can get into some of the strategies that you use. Okay, great. Well, the great thing about the VIX is as opposed to other stocks, it takes a couple of variables out of the way. The VIX only goes between, most of the time, it only goes between about 9 and 20. It can get up to like 80 or 100, but most of the time it stays within a range and it's uh, mean reverting, which means it comes back. You know, if you're trading Square or, you know, a normal stock, it can get away from you one way or the other and it's gone. And so you have to kind of guard against that. But with the VIX, you know, if you if you have enough dry powder and if if you have enough time, it's going to come back for you, which is it's a huge advantage for trading when we get into uh, the specifics of trading options. The VIX. I became aware of it basically in the the mid 90s. It was basically just sort of an indicator on the floor that sort of told you what the to, in my mind it kind of told me what the average volatility of the stock market was at the time and it was a way lower number than than your normal equity. I think when I first found out about the VIX it was trading about 18 or not trading but it was 18. And what the VIX is, it is a a number based on a formula of a strip of puts in the SPX. So that's a huge mouthful. But what, what it basically means is there, we're looking at the prices of put options in the SPX. Now, the SPX is, I think, like 80% of the trading in the world goes to the SPX. It's, it's a huge focus. Generally, most people, like if you have a 401k or if you have savings, most people are long the SPX in some way as a way of saving. Like when, when, nor, when most people say, I don't mean to say normal, but what I mean is like non-trader investors... No, no, no. They're normal people. We consider them to be regular, normal people, not advanced human beings like traders are. Yes. (laughs) When normal people, you know, say that they're in the stock market, it means that they own stocks and generally in some way they own something in the SPX. And so fund managers, the average fund manager owns the SPX and they want to hold on to it because they want to collect the dividends from the stocks as part of the return. And so if the market looks bad a certain day or month or week, they don't want to sell out of their position. Instead, what they do is they buy put options to protect themselves to the downside. And so when more people are nervous, that gets reflected in the put options being bid and thus the VIX goes up. So that's kind of why they call the VIX the fear indicator. And the VIX not being just this number that's based on some formula, there's not a direct way you can trade it. The only way you can trade it is by trading the futures, which were developed for the VIX. I think the futures were developed in like the early 2000s, and but they track the VIX very poorly, and in that is an opportunity for traders. So when you mean track the VIX poorly, because you can trade VIX like VIX options, but what you're saying is, you know, forget those. You don't want to trade. I guess let's say raw VIX. You want to trade the futures on VIX slash VX, right? Well, VIX options are based on the individual futures. So that's all based on the futures as well, which don't track very well. And VIX options, um, if you have VIX options in a certain month, they're going to correlate to that specific month's futures. And people generally don't do calendar spreads in the actual VIX options. But those options as well track poorly to the VIX. So for example, today, if you look at the VIX right now, um, it's trading 1230 and the front month future is trading 14, and the second month future is trading 15, 15. So what we look at is the relationship amongst the futures. And uh, we chart those on a graph called the term structure. And those are meaningful to us uh, for a number of reasons. But essentially, VIX has 
ETFs, ETPs, exchange traded products, excuse me, exchange traded products that that simulate the VIX that are based on the futures. And so a lot of people, if they want to own the VIX or short the VIX, they will trade VIX ETPs. The most well-known ones are VXX, UVXY, SVXY is an inverse one. And that is essentially all I trade these days. Nice. Interesting. Okay. So most of your trading is tied up in those because of the term structure and basically with VXX having to continuously sell front and buy back, right? And that that contango is basically deadly in most cases. So how do you trade VXX and or UVXY? Right. So like you said, I just want to get into that contango thing for a second longer. Um, yeah, because so, I think people need to understand, and, and I'd love to have you go through why it you know is you know such a drag, a negative drag, because we've gone over it in other shows too, but it's great to hear from a different side or different way of explaining it. Well, I found with the options, uh, repetition is key to learning. And with the VIX, like with also just with options theory and trading in general, for me, it took me a while of repetition before I got it. For me, learning about, Vic, about uh, options, like synthetics, puts versus calls, I didn't understand any of that stuff at first. And it took me going through a few times over, more times over, and then finally stuff started to click for me. And it, it's, it works the same way with the VIX. And so I, I would definitely say to, to viewers, if, if stuff sounds a little bit confusing to you, just stick with it because it will, it will come to you. It just it does take some repetition. Certainly. It's a lot of confusing terminology, but honestly, it's not that bad when you break it down. So yeah, it's the repetition that counts. Yeah, totally. So Contango refers to the fact that as you move out in time, the futures are in a state where the front month future is lower than the next month, which is lower than the next month. So if you if you think in your mind of a curve of all the futures moving out in time, it would be like an upward sloping curve. And the VIX ETPs, the, their goal and their formula is to maintain a 30 day, the VIX 30 days out. And the way they do that is by a mixture of the two front month futures. And so first day after expiration, the, the second future is exactly 30 days out. So you just need that one future. But the next day, as a day goes by, that future is aged a day. Now it's only 29 days out. And so you need to mix in another farther out future to get that 30 day horizon. So every day, VIX ETPs, they take whatever the number of days in that particular month is. And they, so if it's 30 days in a month, they take one thirtieth of their cash value and they roll it out to the next future. And this act of rolling every day is called rebalancing. It is really what creates drag and inefficiency. And so we track every day the relationship between the first two futures and we call that contango percentage. And the way it works out is if contango is 10%, then that represents 10% a month that these things are going to decay. And the way it works in, in practice is more complicated than that. But essentially, if you have a VXX, which is $30, and all things are equal, if Contango is 10%, it's going to decay 3 bucks a month. So if the VIX is twelve thirty now, and VXX is $30 now, then a month from now, with Contango of 10%, VXX will be 27. So you've got this slow drag pulling you down. And the way I found uh, the VIX ETPs was that I was looking at other leveraged ETFs, the gold ETFs and the natural gas ETFs, where you have an ETF that needs to, to, to re-leverage every day. They, if it's a three times ETF, you get decay in those too, because as things go up, you're buying extra futures. And as things go down, you're, you're selling extra futures. And uh, We tend to call that beta drift. And we don't deal with that as much now in the VIX products because after last February, a lot of these products got deleveraged. So there's not as much decay from beta drift as there was. For example, UVXY, which is my major product, it was a two times leveraged product, but it was uh, nerfed or uh, deleveraged uh, earlier this year. So now it's only one and a half times. So beta drift is not as much of a, of a, of a factor. But Contango is very important because... That's something that's eating away every day at these ETFs. Right. And it's mostly in Contango, right? Because it doesn't always happen that way. But, you know, the vast majority of time, is that correct? Yeah, it's about 80 to 85% of the time these things are in Contango. And if you think about it, if somebody wants to, to buy protection, if you want to buy insurance from somebody, you're going to have to pay a little bit of a premium. So if the curve were flat, then that would mean that 
you could buy protection for a crash or you could get long the VIX and you could just hang out forever until there was a crash and you'd be guaranteed to make money. So it kind of makes sense that these things w- would have a little bit of a, of a decay on them. And yeah, as I said before, it's about 85% of the time these things are in contango. We had a huge event at the beginning of this year, the Vomageddon, which I'm sure your viewers are familiar with. Yep. Well, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at UVXY now. And, it, you know, like the reason I say that is because I want people to know that it's not a slam dunk trade all the time, right? Like it's, you know, there's a, a pricing structure that makes it favorable to trading for somebody like you or me. But it doesn't mean that's always a slam dunk because UVXY at the beginning of this year, I mean, I guess that whatever it is right now, I don't know if they've done an adjustment or, you know, reverse split, but went from basically eight to $30 in seven days. I mean, it was just massive jump, right? right? So it can go sideways very quickly. And like you said, it, it came all the way back down, right? Took six and a half months to do that. But that takes a lot of patience and commitment to to ride that out, I guess. These effects are gradual. So if you were to sort of extrapolate how much this effect at 10% contango is having on the stock per day, it would, it would be something like two or three cents. So in the short term, what the VIX is doing is going to affect UVXY much more, or TVIX, much more than uh, these contango effects. So yeah, people tend to like kind of overemphasize them sometimes because they are they are there, but you kind of have to be patient and pick your points for them. So how would you trade then? So getting to the topic of like how you would trade, you said you trade VXX, UVXY, and maybe you said, if I'm right, you trade UVXY a little bit more. How do you trade these? Like what's your, what's the strategy behind it? And then we can dig down to the details. Well, the strategy behind it is to take a ride on the short train in some way. If you were to pull up a chart of these three-year chart, you would see them going straight down. So the question is, how do you strategically short these issues and protect yourself from a big move to the upside? Because remember, in this issue, the big move is going to be to the upside. It's the opposite of like the Dow or the SPX where like the crash the big move you're afraid of is like, oh, the market's going to crash and it's going to go straight down. Uh, This is the opposite. The big move you're afraid of is it's going to spike to the upside. And you kind of have to guard about that at all times. And that's reflected in the fact that most of these are hard to borrow stocks. So even if you wanted to just short shares of it, it can be very difficult to do because there isn't the stock available to short. Mm -hmm. So how would you play with options then? So what we do is we use options and I tend to to give myself a, a good amount of time. And what I like to do is I like to wait until there is some sort of spike. Not, it may not have to be like one you were talking about where it goes from 8 to 30. But you know, every couple of weeks, we see a little up move in the VIX. The VIX, you only have to look it back about two or three weeks to see it. Uh, it's 17 with it 12 today. And so I wait for a little bit of a, of a spike. And I generally will buy put spreads, put verticals somewhere between... 45 to 60 days out. And and you can pick how aggressive you want to be uh, as far as high risk trade. Like if you want to make a higher risk trade that, has, that would have a little less return, you could pick selling the at the money strike and buying a, a higher strike in a put spread. So for example, UVXY right now is eight, around 825. You might pick the November 10, 8 put spread, something like that. For a risk reward, or some people will sell a call spread. Uh, you know, as we know, selling a call spread or buying a put spread are, are very similar in, in terms of uh, options trading. People, if you want to be more aggressive, you might go a little farther out and pick something like, let's see, like a Jan eight six put spread or a Jan nine five put spread, where you're buying the uh, the higher strike and selling the lower one. And uh, that way, I know that I have a defined risk trade where. I can't, you know, blow out my position. I don't want to blow out my account in any way. When I first started trading uh, UVXY, I was selling naked calls. It, it can be a very profitable thing to do, but you can wake up and have your account go negative one day. And I, I don't, I don't really want that to happen at this point in my life. You know, when I was a young kid and I didn't have responsibilities, I was more of a gunslinger. But these days, I prefer to know uh, what my my downside is. Yeah, I agree. I call them rodeo cowboys, the people who do that. Like everything is good until you get bucked off, right? And that's really what it comes to. <laughs> you know, like everything is awesome until you get thrown off the bull. And that's that instance too. So I would agree with you as, you know, if you're going to do something in, you know, a volatility product, do it risk defined. You know, know exactly what you're getting yourself into. 
because it works and great until it doesn't, right? Until you have that January, February spike where, you know, it quadruples in price and you're out in the wind, basically. So let me ask you this question. So you do a lot of spreads. Would you do any just uh, like single put buying and then buy a deeper in the money put, like a 70, 80 delta put and just play it that way versus a spread? Yeah. And I like to sort of leg into a spread by doing that as well. Um, and the other thing you can think of doing is, yeah, buying, starting out by buying a, that put and then, and then looking for something to do against it. It might be selling a lower put when things move your way a little bit. It might be even doing a calendar spread. Lately, I've been looking at calendar spreads in VIX products, for example, in VXX. If, with VXX right now, 28.74. I might calculate in my, in my head, okay, VXX is going to be, in a couple months, it's going to be around 26. So I might actually enter into a calendar spread centered around the 26 strike so that my sort of prediction of where we're headed to is the short strike of that calendar spread, or I mean the strike of the calendar spread. And that way I can sort of collect a little decay as we move down. Because lately, especially this year, we've seen these things kind of stagnate for a little while. And so I'm sort of careful about being long puts for too long because they could just kind of die on the vine before I get the move I'm looking for at, at times. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you're doing a put calendar, you know, say a little bit below where it's at, you know, trying to I guess, play the fade lower, right? Correct, yeah. So I've been interested in, in, in checking out calendars lately in that way, uh, trying to find a way to uh, collect premium a little bit. It's very instructive that we had that big spike at the beginning of this year because it reminds everybody that that can happen. At, at this time last year, before we had that spike, I was spending a lot of my time reminding people that something can happen because it hadn't happened in a while. And people forget that something can happen. It takes a little bit of patience to wait for to get that little spike before you jump on board these things. But it's definitely worth your while uh, waiting for an opportunity. Yeah, you know, I think it's I mean, look, we're all humans. And I think most of us, you know, tend to have a very short term mindset, right? I mean, that's why we start. That's why, like, I personally believe that we see the same thing repeat itself historically time and time again. It just comes in a different form, but it comes down to lack of patience and being overly allocated, too much risk. I mean, it's all the same stuff that, you know, happens time and time again. I mean, I even look at like Hawaii right now that's, you know, has the major hurricane where they've had five hurricanes since the 1950s. You know, you can't tell me it's never going to happen again. That's what people thought for a long time until it does. And so I look at the VIX. VXX, all these volatility products, very much the same way as, you know, just wait for the, you know, spike if you want to play a spike and, you know, let it kind of come to you. You know, don't be out there chasing it lower because it might end up burning you if you're being super, super aggressive as it's going down. Maybe wait for a little bit of a spike first. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to think of people who like to get long this as the people who are looking for that big, that big win, which is, Sort of, it's sort of the suckers play in a way, but there is an intelligent way to do that. Which one of the intelligent ways to to get long, it if if that is your your wish, would be to sort of wait until vol gets kind of low at this period. Maybe kind of low might be eleven, something like that, and then to go ahead and sell some out of the money puts that are kind of below the horizon of where you think it could go to. And then when you get that pop, you can do something against those. I, I love. Because I was a position trader for many, many years, I love constructing options positions like one piece at a time. Like like you said, maybe we'll, you'll buy a put and then you'll look for well, what's the best thing I could do against that considering what's happened in the market today or yesterday or you know what's happening moving forward. And I'll slowly conduct a position that way. I'm not afraid to have what would turn out to be kind of like a strange looking position that you wouldn't actually put on like all at once. I, I'm not afraid to like kind of add to my position in a UVXY or actually in any, in any options position by just finding out what's the next best piece in my little puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I mean, I think it's an interesting, you know, topic because, you know, for me, like, you know, volatility products hit on a lot of, you know, emotional and psychological levels as well as position sizing and timing, you know, that I, I like the idea of doing them. And, you know, like we were talking before this, like my goal is to be able to take you know, what I learned from you and other people who trade them and, you know, create a system to be able to do it automatically. And so I think it's fascinating. I think it's, it's crazy to me that it's actually increased in volume, like volatility products like VXX have now become, 
you know, very much mainstream and are starting to increase volume even more when we know that this is the structure of it. But like you said, it's those massive spikes that keep everyone honest. I think that probably institutions, even though it's a bad way to hedge things by getting long VIX uh, products, it's it's probably like the the least bad way for some of them to hedge things. Like I could imagine like a firm being sort of regulated by they had to have the risk at a certain level. And so they might buy one of these for short term or for some other other reason like that. I call it a job hedge. I think it's probably more of a job hedge, you know, that if any major, you know, fund manager, money manager gets caught in a situation where the market goes down and they don't have a hedge on, you know, that's a lose your job situation, right? So it's kind of yeah. like that's job insurance for them. You know, they they know that they're going to lose potentially on it, but if they don't have it in place when they need it, they're going to be out on the street. Well, I think that your idea of your new trading program that's automated would fit really well over over VIX products because as far as strike selection, you could put in say like okay, well, I'm looking for an 80% success. I'm looking for an 80% success uh, probability and it would select certain strikes. And then if you said, well, I'm, I'm willing to decrease that to 60% and be more aggressive because I have a feel, you know, I, I feel like a uh, vol's coming in or, or whatever reasons, and it would change, uh, change the strikes for you. Because like I said, when you, when you remove a couple variables, with VIX, you don't have, some, you don't have the VIX isn't going to double and stay there. It's not going to go to two either. And so when you have um, taken away a couple variables, it makes it much more easy to model with a computer system. Yeah, it's fascinating. So let's talk about position sizing real quick before we kind of wrap up on this, because I think, you know, position sizing for me is something I harp on a lot, controlling position sizing, controlling risk. When you trade a volatility product and if you're almost exclusively trading it, how do you know, or, or like, what do you look at for position sizing to say, okay, this is the position size I'm going to start with, or do I scale into it? Do I not? How do you look at that? That's a great question. And that's one of the biggest challenges is that like a lot of people, I always want to like, if I think I have a good idea, I always want to like put as much money as I can into it. And I have to fight that even 20 years later, I have to fight that to stay small. And it doesn't go away. <laughs> we're traders. We're just, we're hardwired for wanting to take risk, right? Right. And, you know, when something goes my way, I think to myself, oh, I should have put more into that. Or and it's just, it's just natural, but it's something that you have to discipline yourself on. And uh, I have to like back up and say it to myself and keep repeating to myself, stay small, stay small, stay small. Because A, you want to be able to put more on if things, if things really get, yeah. You always want to be able to put more on. And that was the great thing for me about trading. I was used to trading for a big firm for a long time that essentially had unlimited money. And so if things got juicy, you could go bigger. But it, as an individual, we don't have that. We don't have that. You can't just like be like, ask some bank for another million dollars or something like that. And so we've got to be really careful with the, with the resources we have. And so it's like everything else. You, you have to say small and even more so you have to say small. Now, now that I don't sell naked calls anymore, I have a little bit more of a defined risk, but I look at things the way I did as a market maker, which is for VIX products, I look at what I'll lose for an 85% up move. And I also look for a 200% up move, what I'll lose. I also look at the downside, even though that's less likely, but I always look at what's the worst case scenario. And I start with what's the worst case scenario. And am I, can I accept losing that much money? And that's where I spend a lot of my life is in worst case scenarios. <laughs> I, I think a lot of traders are probably that way. Because if you, if you can guard against all the worst cases as best as you can, then what's left over is profitability somewhere. Yeah, I agree. So my wife would 100% agree that I probably am in the camp of worst case scenario because but you know she handles all of our like real estate stuff that we do and at the first question out of my mouth every time is like all right what's the worst case scenario if we you know buy this piece of property right you know no tenants the house you know we have massive flooding you know we have to replace the roof whatever if it's still okay after that okay good deal you know i agree with you so I can definitely vouch for I live through the worst case scenarios because we've been through the flash crash. That's it. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, if you haven't even been through the flash crash or some of these even recent volatility spikes, I mean, if you started trading in April this year, things are a cakewalk from there. I mean, you haven't seen anything as far as volatility. So you haven't lived through one of those events to know what even happens during it. So you got to, you know, even more so kind of pair it back. Yeah. I mean, any stock to get just back to the general market, anything can happen to any stock at any time. And, you know, for me, I had, 35 to 40 positions on for 
over 10 years like straight. And I can vouch for that anything can happen in any situation. And that's why you always got to go back to your fundamentals of options theory and strategy because that's the stuff that's going to work for you in the end. I, it seems like, oh, it's a new world sometimes. You see one stock that's going gangbusters up or one way or something and you think that like, well, it's different now. But it's not. It always goes back to your fundamentals and what you've learned and uh, I'm sure what people have learned from you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good, man. Well, hey, David, thank you so much for being here. Let me just ask this one final question. What is there anything that we missed today? Like, is there anything that you're like, you know, we should have talked about this, you know, to help people out any major key, like reminder thing that they can watch out for to help them out? Well, I just want to tell you that a generation of people has learned from you in options trading and Pretty much every single person I talk to who's learned options in a non, like non from a firm has gotten something out of your videos and your influence. So a lot, one of many of your fans out there, and I, I just want to thank uh, you on behalf of all of us for, for how much you've taught like a generation of people. It's, it's amazing. It's a great honor to actually talk to you in person. <laughs> Man, it's all mine. Trust me. Believe me. I'm humble to have you on the show and I appreciate that. And by the way, I did not pay you to say that. That was totally... <laughs> That was totally off the cuff. So I appreciate that very much. Yeah. I love your videos for a really long time. I've been watching you and I know all my buddies feel the same way. So thanks so much for everything you've done for this industry. I appreciate it, man. Well, listen, David, how can everyone reach out to you? Where can they find you? I know you've got a YouTube channel, which I've watched some of your videos where you're actually going through kind of, you know, term structure and pricing on trades, but, or what's the best place that people can reach out to you if they have questions? Yeah. So uh, David Lincoln on YouTube, I hang out in stock twits all the time under David Lincoln as well. I'm at the famous Dave on Twitter, and I'm very accessible. Reach out to me and we can talk. Sounds good, man. Well, listen, I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Kirk. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right. So I hope you guys truly enjoyed today's interview with David. Like I had said earlier in the podcast, this was an absolute treat and delight for me to have him on the show. I really enjoyed it. We had a really good time. As you can see, we laughed, we said some jokes, we talked about trading, we you know discussed all kinds of different topics. So I hopefully you really enjoyed it. Again, if you did enjoy it, please send it out to a friend, share it with somebody that you know that's interested in trading or that you talk about trading with. I think it's a a topic and a discussion that you know needs to be heard from both sides. We often hear that market makers are you know the grim reapers of the options trading world, but you can see that it's not necessarily the case if you listen to today's show. As always, you can get more details on the podcast by heading over to optionalpha.com slash show 147 if you want to see some more of the uh, highlights and bullet points from today's show, as well as the transcript from today's show with David. Again, optionalpha.com slash show 147. And until next time, happy trading.